where did we leave off from last time? Let's get to it. What's up, guys? Trying something a little bit different today. Um, well, not that much different anyways, but I'll just get right into it. If you guys haven't followed so far, we've been talking about no more Mr. Nice Guy going through the sidebars of the red pill and the married red pill. If you don't know, too many guys are calling themselves red pill these days and talking about all kinds of weird nonsense that they invented in their head as some kind of weird grift to make their brand more important than everybody else. It's look at, look at me, it's Instagram ass models, and I'm having none of it. So as a public service announcement, I'm going to literally go through the same material that most guys who actually are red pill do and go through a lot of the, um, I guess, field reports, for lack of a better word. Anyways, it's going to be awesome. You're going to love it. And we are at the section of reclaiming your personal power in Robert Glover's No More Mr. Nice Guy. Uh, I think we're good to go here. Yep. Um, so to start off, we're going to define what he means by personal power because... There's a lot of stuff in here that has the same vibe as that Anthony Robbins personal power. The secret is the message. Trust your vibes and feelings and all that other nonsense. So these things are somewhat specifically defined. Um, he starts off with the story. One Sunday morning, a few years back, my wife Elizabeth and I engaged in a heated discussion over something I had done. Like many of our arguments, Elizabeth felt helpless to get me to see my denial. At the same time, I felt unjustly persecuted. Finally, when the argument reached an emotional crescendo, Elizabeth shouted in frustration, you're nothing but a wimp. Or if you're on Twitter, you would say you're nothing but a cock. Or a beta male. Or what do they call them now? Simps. Elizabeth left the room and I retreated to the bathroom to dry my eyes. I really hope this guy wasn't crying, but you know what? Whatever. So after a few minutes of reflection, she knocked on the door. I assumed she was coming back to take another stab at me. Instead, she apologized. That wasn't fair. And actually, he responded, it was the most accurate thing you've said all morning. So nice guys are wimps. And he kind of goes into it here. Um, we've talked before how abandonment issues that come from errant parenting techniques, which makes total sense right now because the millennium generation was raised by boomers, which have had a higher divorce rate and less satisfied relationships than just about any generation before or afterwards. And unfortunately, like the rest of the world, having to pick up after the boomers is kind of what we're all left here doing. And so you go through uh, the abandonment issues, which is more limbic brained. It's about your ego when you were young, not being able to understand that things outside of your experience existed. It's the idea that that two year old you is a narcissist, which all of us are. Nothing exists outside of our own heads. But during those formative years without a second parent, um, non-narcissist doing the teaching and that, we kind of don't develop out of that stage. And that's why we're getting this weird case of delayed adolescence, which has put us all one fit behind. Um, he goes on for a paradigm of powerlessness. So in order to cope with childhood abandonment experiences, all nice guys develop the same paradigm. And I've said it every episode and I'm gonna keep saying it. If I am good, then I will be loved, get my needs met, and have a problem-free life. This is nice guys to a T. Um, we're going to break down a bit more of this one this episode. So unfortunately, it not only produces the opposite of what's desired, but it guarantees nothing but feelings of perpetual powerlessness. If you'll notice, a lot of the online space, and I don't know how much of it's equivalent in the real-life space, but from what I've seen, dial the autism down from 12 to like 8, and you kind of get an accurate picture. But uh, a lot of the, I call them second wave MGTOWs, they kind of go into it thinking, you know, just going to get divorce rape. Why even bother trying? It's that kind of same powerlessness. And it's going to really blow your mind when you see anybody who unironically calls themselves black pilled or uh, MGTOW. I call it the second wave. You can kind of tell the difference between the Terrence Pop and Aaron Clary's and then the rest of them. But where it's all expletives of powerlessness manifesting in you know what you would consider to be misogyny but it's just really uh yeah it's a screaming of powerlessness or in some cases you get that f we gotta fight feminism kind of making them the enemy because then that hides your badness and your ability not to deal with it 
if we're going to go back to other things, there's the Archwingers, women act as shitty as you let them. If you look back at that, it's kind of letting you understand how things like the Karen phenomenon, if you don't notice, Karen is like a middle-aged woman with the bob haircut, super entitled, always asking to speak to the manager. If you haven't seen examples of it, I don't know what to tell you. But these all stem from guys that roll over and act conflict-averse. Girls, their natural proclivity is to test a man. If you remember last episode, we talked about practical female psychology's roadmap of the betaization of modern man. That first phase is testing. I want to see if this guy can put up with a little bit of bullshit. Because if he's not strong enough to handle me, how's he going to handle those bears? And in our limbic cave brain ways, we think we got to defend ourselves against bears and tigers. And as much as we can say that was 20,000 years in the past, it still sticks with us. It's in our DNA. So just aware it exists. Anyways, we're enough rambling. Um, in spite of the fact that we live in a chaotic, unpredictable world, nice guys are not only convinced that life can be smooth, but believe that it should be. This belief is the direct result of childhood abandonment experiences. The unpredictability of not having their needs met in a timely, judicious fashion was not only frightening, it was potentially life-threatening. So in order to cope with the uncertainty of a chaotic childhood, nice guys developed a belief system that if they could just do everything right, then everything would go right in their lives. And this segues into Promise Keepers, as Rollo Tomasi puts it. If you guys haven't seen Promise Keepers, I would strongly suggest you go check it out. I could pull it up, but I got a different article I want to show you guys first. Um, usually what happens, so we talked about those childhood abandonment issues from earlier that most guys will have. It usually involves parents getting divorced, parents getting separated, or just a father having that quiet life of desperation who's sticking it out for the kids even though he's absolutely miserable and he's put himself into a horrible place. So these guys will tend to look at the father and the mother's just complaining about him. She doesn't like him this, she doesn't like him that. Now with hindsight, we know it's just girls like to complain. It kind of gives them energy. It's their, it's their yellow son of Krypton. But as a small kid with an ego attached to that, with your, to an ego attached to you, you don't understand that. So all you think of is like, this stuff is all his fault or it's all my fault that's causing it. And so they, Guys will oftentimes subconsciously or consciously make the decision to never be the man that's angering their mom so much. And that's the promise keeper. I promise. But then the problem is, if you only understand that surface level, you know, subtly tistic version of how women work, you're going to be raised lacking any of the positive qualities that attracted your mom to your dad in the first place. Um, first hand example of that myself. Now, there's oftentimes cases where uh, guys would be what you would consider borderline abusive, emotionally, physically, whatever. Put that aside right now. Obviously, you're not supposed to be abusive. That's fine. And never mind that emotionally abusive is such a fungible, vague amount of territory that there's no way of knowing if somebody is or not. It's totally a subjective thing. Putting all that aside, realize that people don't do what they don't want to do. So if a girl's in that relationship, then that means she wants to be on some level. For some reason, it's getting her needs met. And when guys see this and they put this black and white, positive, you know, negative, good and evil kind of attitude towards it, they miss out on the gray area that is life. And as much as it pains me to say, a lot of people put up with abusive relationships because they want to. Now, we've already talked, I think it was episodes two and three, You'll probably know better than me because you're the ones listening to this, but um, we were talking about the Captain Save a Hose. I think it was Jose in the examples we had before. A lot of these people like fixer-uppers, and it's the same idea with women, that you can tame a savage beast. So these, so it's not that women are any better off. In fact, in most cases, they're worse because they were never really expected to be more. I'm not sure if I'm wording that right, but... The problem is then you remove positive male influences from girls' life, then girls end up being left to their own devices, and they kind of build themselves into the worst of what masculinity can offer in the same way that men are bringing out in themselves the worst that femininity can offer. We're basically swapping things around, but everybody's so bad at it, it just ends up to this kind of dysfunction. Uh, where'd I leave off? 
So he's talking about, again, men develop belief systems, uh, that their childhood was ideal and problem free. This goes back to chapters one and two, where we talked about the everything is good and the everything is bad types of nice guys. The everything is good one just forgets everything that's negative and bad and idealizes it. Oh, my parents were high school sweethearts and it was the most beautiful thing in the world. And I want to have a piece of that. So I need to find myself a 18 year old. And if you want to see how that ends up, I would suggest to go back to the channel, look at the other sidebar series, uh, Michael's story. And that shows exactly what that good type of nice guy becomes. That's the Michael. Um, he goes here, a second part of the nice guys, the reason they don't accomplish their goal is because they're doing the exact opposite of work. what works. A lot of people talk about authenticity. And authenticity is good, sure, whatever. Actually, I think it's kind of benign. It really depends. If you're authentically a douche, then you're just a douche. It doesn't matter if you're authentic or not. But people talk about that. But what I think is more important is to understand congruence. Your actions, your speech, your goals, and your beliefs need to align in the same direction. For example, um, let's use a female example because I know it off the top of my head. I joke often about the sun hat goddesses. And that's an example of a girl that, you know, partied it up all through her 20s. And then at the tail end of I wasted my 20s, she puts on a sun hat, a summer dress, takes a picture of herself in a cornfield, and all of a sudden she's the trad wet dream. It's absolutely ridiculous. But... The point of it is about congruence. Now, if that girl really liked the traditional conservative lifestyle, which it's kind of a fiction anyway, but you know, put that aside for now. If they really wanted that, then they wouldn't have spent their 20s doing this because the traditional conservative lifestyle was by 17, you better be married. And by 18, you guys go get a house together, start pumping out those kids. So it's very incongruent. And that's a lot of the reasons why men who have their act together see that as inherently unattractive, at least at least from a long term. Because short term, if she's hot, good enough. And if she's not hot, well, have I been in a dry spell, slump buster, good enough. But you get the point. So overcoming the wimp flower, flactor, reclaiming personal power. And this is important because he defines personal power here as a state of mind in which the person is confident he can handle whatever may come. It's, I shall tell a story here that kind of emphasizes it, so. Um, I went to school for graphic design because nobody really gave me any direction. It was just follow your dreams. And I was a pretty good artist. So I thought, all right, let's do art for a living. It's a ridiculous decision. But um, so I finished school. I was working. It was not, it was like very hard to get into the space. And then when I was in, the contracts were bad. The pay was horrible. It was generally like, yeah, I liked drawing and I liked art. And I was good at art, but the quality of life took a giant hit to the point where you couldn't even enjoy it anymore. So I got drunk with a buddy. And then we were talking about how both of our dads used to be in the military. And we're like, wouldn't that be cool to join? And we're like, all right. So we drunk, called up the recruiting office, joined up, didn't think anything of it. Next day we woke up, should have known something was wrong because uh, <laughs> all of a sudden the recruitment paperwork was at our doorstep the next day. I'm like, all right. Point is. I'm like, well, I must have known what I was doing when I did it. And so I signed up and went in there. And that was 12 years before my retirement. And it's that certain amount of irrational confidence, the belief, and I know it sounds stupid, but like the belief in yourself, not so much belief in yourself, but understanding that you're capable enough to deal with things as they come up. It makes you spontaneous. It's a display of higher value. It's a very attractive masculine quality. I'm sure anybody who's read any uh, PUA stuff or just game material in general will tell you that that spontaneity, the unpredictability, those are displays of higher value and they're generally tied to masculinity because femininity is more about safety, security, and uh, well, with the exception of materialistas or adventuresses, but that's a practical female psychology thing. That's going to be a different series down the line. So his solutions are surrendering, dwelling in reality, expressing feelings, and facing fears. Now I want to put an asterisk beside all four of these ones because somebody will screw it up if they just take it as the literal thing there. Also developing integrity and setting boundaries, but all these ones need an asterisk. So surrendering helps nice guys reclaim his personal power. Um, I won't go into it here, but it's he uses a lot of positive affirmations, but the easiest way to understand it is to use the serenity prayer just or stoicism, however you want to refer to it. Just know there's things that are in your control and there's things that are not in your control. So for the things in your control, take action. 
For the things that aren't in your control, aloof. Just don't care. Um, 48 Laws of Power has a rule, and I'm trying to remember the law off the top of my head here, but I can't. It's disdain, which you cannot have. The idea being, if there's something out of your control, don't covet it. Simply put. For example, divorce. It is not up to you whether your wife divorces you, or if your girlfriend leaves you, or if they cheat on you. Those are things that are outside of your influence, other than, I mean, persuasive. If you're a girl's best option, she's less likely to do it. It gives you some amount of control over your reaction to these things and your ability to bounce back, but it doesn't guarantee an outcome you want. And this is that nice guy paradigm. Well, what if I if I lift and I get a six pack set of abs and I do all the chores and I handle everything and I don't even let her drive that soft Shiera law that you hear a lot of traditionalists do, which is just a control thing. Again, very feminine. Even if you do all those things, there's no guarantees. And that's fine. And that's what's going to lead me to what I wanted to talk about here. It's a great article by Rolo. I don't reference him much. I really should, but, you know, he references himself enough. This is a post called uh, The Safety Net. I suggest you guys read it. I know his most popular post is Saving the Best. Um, his second one, I can't remember what the second one was, but... That one's good because it shows, you know, a girl getting her come up and everybody likes it. It's kind of got the revenge fantasy. But I would argue that this post is most likely his most important work on there that's really underappreciated. So he makes a reference to the idea that, you know, there is no solutions. Red pill just increases the like, well, I won't want to say red pill, but doing the things that you do based on a lot of the guys in the sphere and what they've done and the field reports over time. It increases the likelihood of success, but it's no guarantee. But in the case of failure, it offers a kind of confidence and a safety net. So in this section here, he's like, exactly right, all of it. My second marriage ended about six weeks ago. My wife left me and informed me she was filing for divorce. And to be honest, I've sort of surprised myself how emotionally unaffected I've been compared to my first marriage ending, which was before Red Pill, Rolo, Rational Mail. I've actually had multiple people comment incredulously at how well I'm doing. I've recommitted to a much more intense and frequent workout regimen of down 20 pounds in those six weeks. I credit my red pill perspective for enabling me to stay relatively stoic about it all and refocus on something positive. I think it helps to realize that I haven't lost my soul Nate, because that's bull to begin with, and that women are fungible, at least partly. 100% accurate, by the way. Don't get me wrong. I feel like I've lost my best friend and have times of sadness. It certainly helps to realize that little Miss Perky Tits, tight ass, tighter, wetter, is out there and I'll be having sex with her soon enough, which he will. The one thing I've seen from every field report of a divorce is guys always manage to trade up for a younger model. Second thing is actually they end up having more disposable income. A lot of guys complain about how divorce rape's ruining this and divorce that and you're paying her to leave. What guys have noticed is while they may have to pay more in child support payments or, you know, whatever, or second apartment, that kind of thing, they've noticed their disposable income ends up going up. So that cheaper to keep her thing, it's a fiction. At least from the field experiences I've seen from it. I've only seen a couple dozen, so take it for what it's worth. Um, I'll add that my red pill perspective also clues me into what awaits my soon-to-be ex-wife who is 43 going on 53 in terms of her menopausal stage and her very overweight. She was fitness model at 32. That's the other thing. I guess this is a bit of a tangent, but whatever, it's worth it. A lot of these guys, the only do 9s and 10s crowd. I only do 23-year-olds, 24-year-olds, and that's fine. You're going to go for young girls. You just want to sleep with them. Hotness is the only factor. I posit this. Out of 100 guys that have only been dating hot 23 year olds and they settle down with one, ask them what it's like at 33. And I guarantee you 80, 90% of them will probably have themselves a girl that let herself go. And it's just, it's the way it is. Actually Black Dragon or Caleb, Caleb Jones, Black Dragon blog has a great post in this. I can't pull it up right now because I'm on stream, but feel free to look at it your own time. He actually kept in touch with, I think it was every girl he had ever dated and then 10 years later, he noticed without exception, like all of them had just gained massive amounts of weight. And he goes, well, what's the point? They're all, they're like all girls are just going to gain weight. It kind of, and it's kind of a freeing thing because you realize that there's nothing you can do to stop it. At the same time, it kind of puts a fire under your butt because um, 
girls let will get away with whatever you let them get away with. So if you're in a relationship and you set strong boundaries, which is something we'll get to a little later in the episode here, setting strong boundaries, setting good examples, keeping yourself in shape and always having that tinge of dread, the idea that you're, she's easily replaceable, or as he puts it, fungible. These are all things that work in your favor, but by no means a guarantee. So when he talks about surrender in here, nice guys reclaiming their power through surrender, is just accepting the things that you cannot change and making it so you're outcome independent, whichever way the winds blow. And that's it. He calls it surrender. I don't like the language. It's not too masculine. I mean, we got to talk about Miller Lite and truck nuts or nobody's going to listen. We're at where we're at. Uh, I'm going to skip past all of his affirmations because he's got like four pages about feeling good. And whatever, your feelings are bad. Uh, dwelling in reality. Again, that's... It shouldn't be, it should be easy. Anybody who's found their way to this space and has gotten this far into this series already knows all the stats that everybody else knows. They've read Dal Rock or at very least seen some charts thrown around and some idiot on Twitter. Like you shouldn't need somebody to tell you the roadmap. Everybody knows it. It's just really how you interpret it and what you do from it. That's what's important. Um, his second part, or his third part here, which I really want to put a caveat on, is expressing feelings help nice guys reclaim their personal power. I read through his and give a couple things that uh, the married red pill guys have found that maybe need some refinement on here. So nice guys are terrified of two kinds of feelings, their own and everybody else's. Any kind of intensity causes nice guys to feel out of control. If you notice that control's coming back, it's always the key to insecurity is control. That's something to think about. As children, feeling things, blah, blah, blah. I remember early in our marriage when Elizabeth would express her frustration over my inability to share what I was feeling. Put a pin in that one too. If you have a chance, go back to the last episode where I talked about the betaization of men through the book Practical Female Psychology. Share what I was feeling. That's phase two. There's the testing phase and then there's the communication phase. So just be aware right there. That is a way of attaching wife goggles to a guy to get him emotionally attached pair bonded so that she can get that comfort and control she requires it's a trap it's limbic brain she doesn't know what he's doing just be aware of it share if you want but don't put any expectations on it and don't do it just because you're asked as the mrp guys say verbal intercourse is optional um, so even as i became aware of my feelings i kept them to myself it's almost comical how infrequently it crosses a nice guy's mind to tell his partner what he's feeling on one occasion, she confronted me with I shared a feeling with her that I had been harboring for some time. Why didn't she just tell me about that when you first felt it, she questions. Eh, I'm doing better, I replied in a typical nice buy fashion. It took me two weeks to get around to telling you. So he frequently hears about nice guys rationalizing their withholding of their feelings and claiming they don't want to hurt anybody. Uh, the goals are to embrace feelings and not make them soft and touchy-feely. So far, he's got it pretty bang on. Men in touch with their feelings are powerful, assertive, and energized. It's all kind of fungible terms anyway. So contrary to what they believe, there is no formula or right way to get reconnected with repressed feelings. He talks about support groups. Um, a couple more examples here. So feelings. Feelings are kind of a double-edged sword. At one point, when you're feeling something, it's adequate to express it in a proper way. That's under, you know, a controlled environment. Um, at the same time, you don't just want to be a child that whatever you're feeling, you emote it. Because this is where guys screw up having feelings. They express them to the other person with the intent of getting validation back. It's the same way girls knitter nattering at Starbucks. There's always the one with the infinity scarf holding her coffee with two hands. And the other girl running her mouth about how she did some dude last night and how he ghosted her. I actually wrote my first book, a lot of it in Starbucks when I was there. Because it was just a nice escape. Got some sunshine in front of the window. And... I had to bring headsets and blast music because they were so annoying. They totally, I could not work around it. And there was always at least seven of them. Seven Karens in training. But, so if you express your feelings with the intent of getting validation. Sometimes, and it's not so much I want the other person to make, tell me it's all going to be better or pat me on the head, but that is a part. A lot of it, what it is, is... I'm angry and I want you to acknowledge that or this is wrong and this is bad and it's made me feel bad and you will acknowledge that. I'm here to tell you right now, girls won't. Because like I've been saying before in many different episodes, everything a girl says stems from her ego. So what that means is as soon as you come with one of these accusatory, accus 
accusatory, validation-seeking statements about how you feel. The girl doesn't hear it as in, I did something and that's probably an accident, so I just need to tell him to feel better. She will take it as an accusation that she is a bad person. Because girls are kind of hardwired to seek that comfort from the herd and rejection and social ostracization is no different than a guy seeing a knife pulled out on him. It taps into that instinct creates a feedback loop she gets fights and her natural instinct is exactly what nice guys do here they project her failures onto him it's all your fault well i wouldn't be like this if you didn't x and it turns into this weird blame game and it's a spiral nobody wins but you're gonna lose girls will fight tooth and nail to not be blamed for anything even if they're 100 percent at fault and they know it it's not their fault it's just they're wired that way same way that if I put a beer in front of you, you're probably going to shotgun it and then crush the can on your head. It's just the way it works. Um, his next part is where he talks about facing fears, helping nice guys reclaim their personal power. So fear is a normal part of the human experience. Everybody experiences it, even those who seem to be fearless. Healthy fear is a warning sign that danger may be approaching. This is different from the fear nice guys experience on a daily basis. For nice guys... Fear is recorded at the cellular level. It's a memory of every seemingly life-threatening experience they ever had. It was born of a time of absolute dependency and helplessness. It originated in not having their needs met in a timely, judicious manner. It is fostered by fearful systems that discouraged risk and rewarded conservatism. It was heightened by the reality of life that is messy and chaotic and any kind of change promises a journey into the unknown. I call this fear, memory fear. And because memory fear is created in childhood, Nice guys approach the world as if it is dangerous and overpowering. To cope with these realities, they typically hunker down and play it safe. I could come up with so many examples about how you're seeing this in the news right now. Guys so conflict averse that they are willing to sacrifice just about everything rather than admit that something's fearful and either it should be dealt with or they don't need to worry about it. That same serenity prayer thing about understanding uh, what you can change in the world. And this is all an insecurity or a lack of confidence. For most guys, let's say, let's say you live in, hypothetically, a six block section of Seattle. And then all of a sudden, a SoundCloud rapper and a bunch of hippies took over the area and claimed it uh, a free zone. I can imagine most people are probably panicking right now. And I guess that because I've jokingly showed it on there on, the, on Twitter every now and again. And you see a lot of guys panicking as if this is like an insurrection. This is, the, this is the end of America. And I'm like, dude, what happened to the generation that used to just walk down there swinging? Like, say what you will about the Proud Boys and what you think they believe and if they're a good or bad thing. Guys are perfectly able, if they're not fearful, to handle things as they come up. And I could imagine just one apartment block of there full of guys who aren't nice guys would probably be able to sort that out pretty quickly. But everybody's fearful, so they're ordering pizzas brought to them. Which is funny, as long as they're vegan pizzas, I think they're safe. Or whatever. But yeah, no matter what happens, you can handle it. That's the gist of it. And... So here's the... Actually, I'm not going to spam on this a little bit. Here's the thing about fear, though. Um, fear is also a very good shaming tactic. Call a guy afraid and... The conversations surrounding marriage tend to reflect that. So a lot of guys say they don't want to get married, and I don't blame them. There's no... Put aside everybody else's justifications, I'll just say this. What is it you get in a marriage that you aren't already getting in just a long-term relationship? There's only one answer I've ever been given by uh, One More Please, actually, where he said, you know, if you're an expat, you're traveling to different countries, for some of them... You guys are really missing out on certain legal rights and responsibilities if you don't have a marriage certificate sanctioned by a government authority. So if you're a diplomat or an ambassador or an expat living in like a traditional Muslim country or, you know, tons of examples there, I won't go too specific. That makes sense. But outside of that, there's really nothing different. All you're doing is giving up that little bit of dread and adding a ton of security with a, quite a bit of risk for you. Now, obviously, if it happens, you can handle it, but why would you? But once you start having these conversations, they quickly turn emotional. Well, you're just scared of getting married. Oh, just be more alpha, bro. And this is where those trad cons kind of slip into that alpha male bravado territory. 
oh dude you just got to be the best alpha man that ever truck nutted masculinity and take your cold showers and raise the kids be the best father ever and don't let your women drive because real men don't let their women drive it's like real men don't let women show their hair real men make sure their women wear burkas it's kind of like this weird Sierra law thing but they want the girl to opt in on it as opposed to like you will do it from like a position of power whole thing's just messed up the whole mental model's ruined and fear has a propensity to shame men especially ones who are insecure so dealing with your fears is the best way not to be manipulated by other people using fear against you so it's kind of got you know double value to it but kind of went on a bit of a tangent let's get back to it uh, the next part is developing integrity helps nice guys reclaim their personal power now this one's important nice guys pride themselves on being honest and trustworthy in reality nice guys are fundamentally dishonest they tell a lie or withhold the truth and still be of the illusion that they are basically honest people since dishonesty is a fear a fear-based behavior telling lies and withholding the truth robs nice guys of their personal power I define lying as telling anything less than the truth. Now, this is the part where Glover's book and um, our experiences and field reports and the married red pill differ. Truth is a weird thing. I'm going to juxtapose it with a post we have, Verbal Intercourse is Optional. This is one by one of our moderators. And if you haven't heard it, it's the idea of guys who always feel like just because your girl demands something or talks to you that you're, obliga or you're obliged to respond. And so he made it a metaphor. Like, picture you trying to smash. And the girl's like, nah, I don't want to. And so you chase her around the house completely naked, rock hard. Come on, come on. And constantly nagging her and hounding her. You would basically call that sexual assault. And you wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> but you don't want to talk. You don't want to talk about things. You don't want to answer this question. You don't think it's a question that, you deser that she deserves an answer to. She hasn't earned the right to earn that part of you that you're keeping to yourself. So when you're hounded and begged and pleaded and followed around the house, why don't you just talk to me? Why don't you just talk to me? It's the same thing as you running around the house, changing her with a, chasing her around with an erection. Now, once guys make that connection, they understand what the equivalents are. They realize communication is the female version of a rock hard one. <laughs> Makes them grow a big rubbery one. You know what I mean? And so... I don't like his definition of lying as saying anything less than the truth. I do agree in the sense that it's not about hiding evidence. If you remember back in episodes one and two, we talked about hiding the evidence or hiding the badness. Here's the difference. Simple example, you go out for a minute to do whatever. Maybe you're running a chore. Maybe you have a side piece. I don't care. Anywhere, in, anywhere during that spectrum. Or just you wanted to go out, have some fresh air for five minutes. You come back, your girl asks, where have you been? And you haven't been, she hasn't been on, let's just say she hasn't been on her best behavior lately, hypothetically speaking. So you're like, yeah, I'm going to go out and I'm not going to tell you where I went because that's none of your business. Or maybe it's just, she has, she's been on great behavior, but it's still none of her business, whatever. It's just like, yeah, um, that's not lying if you don't say it's none of your business or you don't say anything or you just say out. And you cut the conversation off, you fog it, you broken record, amuse mastery, whatever you want to do. The question you ask yourself, and like I said before, back to episode four, selfishness is good. What is in it for me? Now, I said to apply it to everything, but you got to map it to something like this. What's in it for me to tell you? <laughs> I look back in chat and all I see is I thought you were smart from chest. <laughs> but yeah, shut up. STFU. It's got multiple reasons why that's important. I mean, there was one where you don't want to overshare. A lot of guys express their feelings by instinct. A lot of this stuff is instinct. They don't know they're doing it. White knighting girls, guys do it not because they think they're going to sleep with her, because they just don't know any way to interact. In this case, talking about your feelings, largely unattractive, mostly validation seeking. So shutting up is the easiest way to practice that. Now, you may not solve problems you may not become more attractive by being quiet but you're definitely not going to come out unattractive what's that quote from abraham lincoln it's better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open it and remove all doubt i had a post on my old blog about this because a lot of guys they were fearful of being open or not about being quiet 
because they want to be open and honest because, well, well, what do I say if I want to go to the gym and she's hounding me on it and she wants to know where I'm going and hear the stuff and I'm like, you're like, just shut up. Just shut up. Shut, shut your stupid mouth for once. Oh, well, isn't she going to think I'm butt hurt or I'm butt mad or isn't she going to think I'm angry? It's like, yeah, she's going to think you're an idiot. That's, you have been unattractive for a long period of time. The girl's seen nothing but your nonsense, your unattractiveness. I don't care whose fault it is. Just be aware. Perception in this case is she perceives you as unattractive. So yeah, she's already going to think you're an idiot. So you might as well own it. Just shut up. You're going to be an idiot either way, but this way, at least you're not digging yourself a deeper hole. Eventually, you get to a point where you have the confidence in yourself to know when to express your feelings and when not to. Anger is a perfect example of that. Anger is a social emotion. It has two parts. It has uh, pain and it has grievance. Stub your toe, you're hurt, but you're not angry. If somebody hits your toe with a hammer, you're angry. That's because he did that on purpose. He did that against me. And anger is your way of expressing that that's not on. And you better cut it out because otherwise you escalate to violence. That's the, that's the caveman DNA of how women understand it and of how guys express it. Animals have it too. Touch an animal on the head that doesn't like you and you'll see. So where do I get into this? Oh yeah, so just shut up. Just shut up. <laughs> just shut up. It's all you got to do. Um, honesty, again, so you're at this point where you're confident, you know, when you have feelings and then, you know, when you express them, it's what's in this for me. If a girl did something that hurt your feelings and she didn't know, well then, yeah, Hey, just so you know, when you told everybody that I was a trash husband, that hurt my feelings. And naturally girls will test that one for baby. And at that point, you kind of have your answer that she's crossed a boundary. And you start to realize, well, if I talk about it, nothing changes. She just tries to shame me. Conversation goes nowhere. And I'm going to put a pin in this one for now because later on in the episode, we're going to talk about boundary enforcement. What you find in is your actions of defining and enforcing your boundaries become the way you express your feelings. Because talk is cheap. Girls talk way more. They talk amongst their ego. They won't agree with you. They won't validate what you're thinking. The only thing that people understand is strength. And strength comes from power and power comes from being attractive because you can't hold your paycheck in front of her anymore because she's already got a job at HR and she doesn't need no man. Yeah, personal power. Ha! And he brings up a couple things. So I'm going to read this next part here because it's kind of neat. It's a little off topic. I mean, it's on topic for here, but it's off topic of where we're going with this. So bookmark it. So sometimes after telling the truth, nice guys will report that it was a mistake because somebody reacted with anger. Telling the truth is not a magic formula for having a smooth life. Notice the subtle difference here, by the way. It was a mistake to talk because she got angry as opposed to it was a mistake to talk because it didn't solve anything and it just made, it made me look like an idiot or made me unattractive or I got butt hurt. Getting butt hurt is essentially like a fear response. There's the difference and this is why you can't just read how to be alpha in a book. You kind of have to experience it because there's an action that's completely identical in both scenarios. One in which case is very masculine, very good for men, very, very strong for our psychological health. The other one is perfectly damaging. But on a surface, spotatism level of analysis, it looks like the same thing. And that's a big reason why you get a lot of people goofing around, a lot of brands who tell you the right things, but they completely screw up the message. And it really behooves you to become switched on, to go through a lot of this material so you can tell the difference. Because otherwise, you just got the blind leading the blind, the unattractive leading the unattractive, and sexless virgins leading everybody else. And you don't want that. Um, so my, and he talks about integrity here. So my definition of integrity is deciding what feels right and doing it. The alternative is using the committee approach and that's communication and that's compromise. And that's all those good fancy words that you've been told to like all these times. Uh, this method of decision-making and action is based on trying to guess what everybody else would think is right. So let's skip the rest of this and we'll get on to the next section. But first defining what's right. That's a very subjective thing. So I try to make it, and most of the red pill guys try to make it objective as possible. If you don't know what right is, right 
is what offers the most utility for yourself. If you remember, Nietzsche talks about slave and master morality. In this case, and I think it was based on the ancient Greeks. If you remember, it's called the uh, Melanian Dialogues, where um, Athens was going to war with Sparta, and uh, they went to go invade. I don't think it was Milan. I'm fudging up the names. But anyways, that's not the point. So they go in there and are like, look, we're not going to give you the pretense that you decided to be neutral in this war and we need this or that we're good people and you're bad. Simply put, letting you go makes us look weak in front of Sparta and we're going to war. So we're going to take you over unless you pledge to us because we're strong and you're weak and you don't have a choice. And Milan started appealing to morality and this and that. And they're like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> do it or else. So the strong do as they can and the weak suffer as they must. I'm not talking physical strength here. I'm talking strength as in freedom. The freedom to be able to enact your will on the world is largely what power is for men, at least nowadays. So what is right? Things that are right are things that benefit you in the ways that you deem essential. And the things that are wrong are the things that don't. That's the rational egoism. That's the way to consider how to be masculine in a modern environment. We can get into uh, the benefits of altruism, but... Altruism works in proportionate amounts and in a society of scarcity. When you're not in a scarce society, it's not as useful because there's no need to be altruistic. Everybody can get their own. There's enough for everybody. So altruism there is just an encouragement to be taken advantage of. Now, I'm not saying there's no purpose to it, but if you look back on it, and there's a good read for this, by the way, is Mark Twain's What is Man and a Collection of Essays. Altruism, and he talks about altruism in there. It's like a conversation format, a lot like Plato's Air Republic or Plato's Republic, where he says um, they were talking about altruism. Well, what about a man? Why doesn't he do things for the good of everybody? And it's like, well, doesn't he feel good when he does these things to help his community, to help his children, to help his wife? Yeah, he feels good. So all altruism is is a man trying to soothe his soul. So altruism is still kind of selfish. So if you're going to be selfish either way, you might as well at least be doing it in a calculated fashion to ensure that you're not lighting yourself on fire to keep others warm. So that is a nice, more refined definition of integrity because it's way too easy for guys to take that idea of integrity and doing what's right and equate that to mean what's right for the women. Take a lot of guys who have been raised by women. You take a lot of guys who have had this feminized society and what's good for women ends up being what's right. And it's a very clever trick. I don't want to blame feminism for it because they kind of were just riding the coattails of it. I don't really care who is at fault. Just know it's there. And the worshipping of women is kind of hardwired into our DNA. Because without women, we don't make the babies. You need one guy to make 100 kids. But you need 100 chicks to do it. So that's something to think about. Uh, now, back to the topic. So setting boundaries helps nice guys reclaim their personal power. And out of all the parts in this chapter... This part is most important. I see the super chats. So I'll get to those at the end. Uh, boundaries are essential for survival. Learning to set boundaries allows nice guys to stop feeling like helpless victims and reclaim their personal power. I demonstrate the concept by laying a shoestring on the ground. I tell the nice guy that I'm going to cross this boundary and push him backwards. I instruct him to stop me when he begins to feel uncomfortable. It's not unusual for a nice guy to stand well back from the line, allowing me to violate his space several steps before he even begins to respond. Once I start pushing, it's not uncommon for him to let me push him back a couple steps before he does anything to stop me. Sometimes I push him all the way to the wall. So he uses this example as a graphic demonstration of the need for boundaries in all areas of your life. And... Actually, we'll go back to this sec. So, when setting boundaries... In a modern era, we only have certain tools. Back in the day, violence was what kept us civilized. Dueling culture was a thing. Um, the rule of thumb was a thing. Violence was essentially what kept everybody right. Armies were there to make sure you never went against the king, yada, yada, yada. Luckily, we're more civilized now, and so violence is never the answer. We're at a point where there is no greater loss of frame and larger consequence than a man has to resort to violence. So what do we have in the meantime? Boundaries. Well, outside of violence, what do we have for boundaries? 50 years ago, it used to be you were the financial contributor to the household. I brought home the bacon. And that's the traditional marriage uh, 2.0 model. 
well, I can't leave him. He provides for the kids. He's a good earner, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't know what to tell you, but women now earn hundred or dollar on the dollar for men. Some say it's a dollar eight. Some say it's 70 cents. Either way, it's enough for them to survive and thrive on their own. So economic power is no longer the way that you can establish dominance in a relationship. So what's left? Well, if you remove the beta bucks side, and if there's alpha fucks and beta bucks, the things that create desire and the thing that create comfort, if the comfort has already been taken over by our technological society, we have dishwashers, we have washing machines, we have Uber Eats, girls can bring home the bacon, bacon's $3 at the grocery store, it doesn't even take that much. What's left is the alpha, the tingles, the generating desire, the social status, all that stuff that pickup artists used to talk about back in the day to get them in a girl's bed in seven to 10 hours is the stuff that matters now. Guys need to consider themselves. If you want to, from a marketing perspective, we're no longer a commodity, we're a luxury good and we need to market ourselves accordingly. So back to the question is how do you enforce boundaries without the previous tools we used to have and our grandfathers and fathers would have taught us if Karen didn't kick them out, is you have your attention, your affection, and your commitment. You no longer have the stick, so you can remove the carrot. Now these tools only have any teeth in them based on your sexual market value or relationship value or your social standing. Sexual, we'll say sexual market value for short. If you're a fat schlub, she can't stand you, you pull away your attention, you're doing her a favor. If you pull away your affection, she doesn't care, she's hiding from you anyway. If you pull away your commitment, doesn't care. She can earn her own money, she doesn't need yours. But as a girl's hypergamous best option, and being her best option doesn't necessarily mean you're doing this all for her. It just means getting yourself into whatever social circles you're in, into the top 20% of it. A lot of guys think, well, why would you try that? I'm surrounded by chads. I have no chance. Well, here's the thing. This stuff is not, there's not a single hierarchy. There's multiple ones. It's like a matrix. I use the example of the uh, CEO in a company is like the alpha guy there, you know, the high earners there, very attractive, the top 20%, but the guy in the mail room, nothing really. There's no benefit to sleeping with him. You can't do a Me Too accusation to the stock boy. But on the weekends, that guy's running a gig at the bar. He's the most important guy in that room. The CEO goes to that, and he's just that nerd in khakis who went to go watch one of his coworkers. Then when the guy's not there working his band, he's just sitting there. He's a normal patron at the bar. The bartender, he ends up being the most important guy. So there's always multiple different avenues to establish a hierarchy and to establish yourself as the top 20%, which makes you a hypergamous best option to whoever's within whatever measure of social circles you have. Now, I know we're kind of rambling here and going off on a tangent, but it's kind of important because I want to get to a lot of guys know of. Um, it's a Vox Day thing. I don't really like it, but it's kind of illustrative for a lot of the uh, things guys get wrong. So you can think of an alpha male, and that's all the desirable traits put into an archetype. You think of a beta male, which is all the comfort, good husband, father traits put into an archetype. You can think of an omega male, which is everything unattractive. If you think incel, that's an omega male. There's this other concept called a sigma, or a renegade alpha, or um, a, context, a, compartment, a contextualized alpha, or all ways of thinking. A lot of guys think of that. That's what I am. And it's not true. They're not. There's actually something called gamma, but we're already getting nerdy enough here. But here's the point. There's no such thing as a sigma male. It's just an idea that being having those alpha characteristics being the top of whatever hierarchy you're in can have people from other topping their hierarchies coming into your hierarchy. So it makes it's a very weird dynamic where they don't have any social standing in it, but they've clearly got all the traits of somebody who would. So it's a very confusing thing. And that's what it actually means. So when a lot of these guys talk about, oh, I can't be a girl's hypergamous best option, like you can, you just got to start associating yourself with things that you tend to be more socially adept at qualified at competence insert whatever jordan peterson speech you want there it's fine uh where did i leave off boundaries yeah so your boundaries only matter insofar as you have an ismb now this is why when you talk about the professor's levels of dread um that's another book we'll get onto the sidebar here when you talk about dread step one is about building frame setting boundaries step two is about building a life outside of your woman and that's why it's important because you're learning to build yourself as a top tier man in one of many or multiple re, uh, different 
social environments or social matrices. This is the kind of thing that will make you attractive across the board. If you don't believe me, think of that esports. When you think esports, you don't think attractive guys. You think a bunch of nerds playing video games, earning big money, sure. But remember that one Spanish weather girl who was dating the esport e guy and she was annoying him, so he dumped her? Like, it's amazing. Topping things will always make you attractive, even if they're unattractive things. And now it's at the point that gamer girls are a thing. So as soon as something's attractive enough, girls will flock to it. They love attention and they love niches. So how does this all tie into boundaries? Well, building up this value is what gives your boundaries any teeth. In Glover's example of pushing a guy until the guy pushes back, the guy has the physical ability to push back Glover and he was given permission. So right there, he's giving them the tools that they need in a in a controlled environment so they learn okay build value establish boundary easy enough now it's not unusual for recovering nice guys to go a little overboard when they first learn about boundary setting 100 percent the case i know a lot of guys refer to this as going rambo what it's not but it seems to have been morphed in that so going going rambo this is a term that came from a character that was on the married red pill a couple years back he called himself alpha as wolf and that's why we always joke around when anybody calls themselves a dog of some sorts, because it's like, it just means you're LARPing. So he had a sexist relationship, same story as everybody else. And guys were telling him, okay, there's this stuff. And there's like a hundred things you could do, but he didn't analyze which one of them were important to his situation, which ones were applicable to him, which ones weren't. And so he was trying everything. And he came back with, um, how did the story go? I'm going by memory on this one. He was having sexy times with the wife and she complained that his hands were cold and he used amused mastery or agree and amplify. Oh, whatever. Thinking that you can just alpha your way through cold hands and then kept touching her. She got turned off by it. She got mad. He got a little handsy. He came back. She's angry and she's threatening to call the cops. What up? And we basically had to kick him out. It's like, dude, you're going to hurt yourself. Don't do any more of this. You're done. Jack Ten of Hearts, another prolific poster from back then, he made a great analogy. He's like, so this is what you're doing. You're going, you're told to go to the store. So you're getting in your garage, you're going into your car, you're flicking the locks up and down, you're moving the light switch, you're hitting pedals, you're pushing buttons, and then you're wondering why you're not at the store buying bread. You're just trying things without any analysis whatsoever. Just whatever we say you're gonna do it, like a lemming jumping off a bridge. And that's not how this works. So that's going ramble, but people have since come to adopt it in a nice guy standpoint where you're going to establish boundaries. Now, when you're first learning to calibrate what boundaries you can enforce and which ones you can't, because there's some that you're not going to enforce them. So they're just fake boundaries anyway, and you're hoping on the goodwill of the other person. They're kind of a thinly veiled ultimatum. So in setting boundaries that maybe you didn't want to set, maybe they're too much, maybe they're too little... Uh, girl gets angry, girl gets this, the girl gets that, and they think it's going ramble, but it's not. It's just guys who aren't, either haven't thought through their boundaries well enough to understand which ones they want to enforce and which ones they won't, or which ones they can't. You remember I got back to controlling the things you can. Some things you just can't make boundaries for. And the only boundary you can have for a lot of things is like to leave the relationship. So that's not going ramble. That's just guys applying the nice guy paradigm and having to be dragged away from it tooth and nail so just realize we've talked before about how you're your only judge you can't be seeking validation from other things verbal intercourse is optional and your boundaries are all you have pull your attention pull your affection pull your commitment commensurate with the boundary that was crossed and they only have value if you have a high smv put that all together you get in a situation here that your boundaries don't have to make sense. They don't have to be reasonable. People don't have to agree to them. You don't need a committee to approve of them. They don't need to be socially acceptable. They just have to be yours and you have to be willing to enforce them. There's gonna be tons of cases where you get your average blue pill Redditor crapping on some blue, red pilled guy. A good example is, um, I'm sure you guys have seen her, is Kate. She's on Twitter a lot. We've kind of known her from way back. Every time we talk about guys getting their own, she's always coming in being very argumentative and that does not agree with all these things. And there was this other guy, Ultimate Cat. Talked about a story before. Needless to say, 
his wife went out to lunch with an ex-boyfriend or ex-husband or something like that. Somebody she used to be slumping. And he found out about it and he asked about it and she lied about it. So for him, that was it. Boundaries crossed. Consider her have cheated. He basically fixed himself and he started doing everybody that would... All the soccer moms in the neighborhood. He was, he was sowing a seed there. So she shit on him constantly over this stuff. That's not right. That's not moral. Either leave her or don't leave her. He's like, I don't want to leave because, you know what? I want to see my kids till they turn 18 and I don't trust her to parent them alone. So he made that decision. Would you agree with it? Say in the chat. I'm going to guess a lot of people don't. A lot of people really hate the idea of infidelity, but he doesn't care. It's his decision. It's not theirs. Now that's, say what you will about the ethics of what he's doing or the morality of what he's doing or the sensibility or the smartness. Like, is it a good plan? Is it going to work out in the long term? Is it not? Put all of that aside. If we can just get guys to have that level of self-interest in their boundary enforcement, I think we'd be far better off and I wouldn't have a job anymore. So something to think about there. Eh, he's got some examples here of boundaries, but I like mine better. So this last part, um, taking a walk on the wild side. So there's no key to a smooth life. Being good or doing it right, good and right are in quotations, doesn't insulate nice guys from the chaotic, ever-changing realities of life. Again, back to that Rolo article I just showed you about the safety net. It's not about making your life safe. It's about weathering the things that happen and trusting in your ability to weather the storm. And that's all it really is. So as recovering nice guys begin to surrender, dwell in reality, express their feelings, face their fears, develop integrity and set boundaries, they access a power that gives them the welcome and embrace the challenges and gifts of life. Life isn't a merry-go-round. This is all very well and good. Life won't always be smooth, it won't always be pretty, but it will be an adventure, not one to be missed. So this is another thing that makes it a very attractive thing. Um, do I have to explain why being attractive is important here? I don't think I should, but you know, just in case. Being attractive is good because attractive gives you power and power gives you options. It's a soft power. Same way I said, being attractive is what gives your boundaries teeth. Being attractive is what gives you outcome independence. Being attractive, and I don't just mean physically, I mean whole package no unattractive qualities only attractive qualities you can call it being a leader you can call it whatever you want just understand that container is a very specific container everything that fulfills your master morality in other words increases and improves your opportunities and outcomes consider that attractive best way to look at it So that's it for this one. I noticed a bunch of super chats. So we're going to go back in and go from go from the top. Uh, if anybody did theirs before, Thomas Pa, let me know. Thank you, by the way, Thomas. I see your five pound super chat. Cheers. Uh, no comments on it, but be a closed book. Great post on that. Yeah, it's not. I guess I'll specify here. So it's not about being a closed book. It's not about being secretive. It's not about anything. But let's put it in a in a value proposition. You consider yourself the most valuable person in the world. And if you don't, you should. Same as that two-year-old. Everything is based on your ego. If that sounds like what I just said girls do, everything comes from their ego, yes, I did. But you're better at it. Better for you. It's not my job to justify it. Just treat it as so. Just treat it as such. Who the hell are you to have this personal part of me in your life? What have you done to earn my honesty, my integrity, my gifts. Think of it that way. Great example was from the old pickup days where Mystery used to, I think it was Mystery. Maybe it was Tyler Durden, I don't remember. Anyways, picture after every opening a girl, every conversation, they automatically get $100. Doesn't matter how the conversation goes. Doesn't matter if you're good, you're bad, you're ugly, whatever. Right there, it allows guys to reframe their interactions as, well, what's why would she want to talk to me? What do I offer? It's like, no, you being there is the value. And that's the mentality you have to go into these things. It's an irrational confidence. That's how it works. Of course, there's you have to kind of detach it from being delusional because, I mean, that's what Anthony Johnson, president of the Manosphere, thinks of himself too. But you all everybody kind of knows that insecurity that stems from it. So there has to be a lot of self-awareness behind that. At the same time, if you are self-aware and you're not a well-integrated, attractive red pill man yet, fake it till you make it. But you know you're faking it. 
you know you're faking it, you know you're trying to make it, and you know you'll eventually be there. That small nuance, that small bit of self-awareness makes all the difference. Yeah, maybe you're a little insecure about something, but that's nobody's business but yours either. Yeah, I'm working on it. I'll fix it. I don't need you to tell me that it's going to be good or I don't need to. Like, I'll, I've already done all the mental math on this. Uh, Rumblefish, thank you. $10 super chat. My opinion, this content understanding is one, applicable now, two, applicable to any relationship or anything you do, and three, fixes nearly any misery you have right now in life. Pretty much. It's funny because there's no... I don't know how to word this other than to make it sound really stupid, but I'm just going to do it. There's no consequences in modern life. There was a video I used to show on uh, my old post about irrational confidence, the one that Jack and, Jack 10 and I got in a fight over, where I showed this guy called himself Captain Amazing. He was one of those backyard wrestlers. Set up like a 12-foot ladder by his pool, and he was going to jump off the ladder into the pool. Well, he slipped, banged his back off the fence, and cracked his head off the pavement in the side of it. And the video was like a horrific thing. You watch this and I'm like, oh my God, it was like 10 times as bad as watching a skateboarder get hit in the nards. But then the video goes on, like, because it was an old VHS one from like the 90s. So it doesn't stop as soon as the movement stops. It keeps going and he's just laying there. He's not moving. So at first you're laughing because it looks hilarious. You're laughing, you're laughing. And 30 seconds later, then you're like, oh my God, is he okay? And then for another minute, you're like, oh my God, he's horrible. I, gotta hope, I hope he survives. And then... A minute and a half in, you start laughing again. You realize this is just going on and on. It's like that family guy where he's like, ah. So the point of that is that guy didn't die. In fact, he recovers fully. So it's very hard to die. You can take over a six block square of Seattle and not die. Basically have your own little small insurrection. You could be so bad at planting crops when you do that, that you put some dirt on cardboard and lose it to a homeless man, and you still won't starve. It is impossible to die unless you really go out of your way. Like right now, the only thing that will kill you is suicide, pretty much. Maybe a cop, but even then the odds are pretty, are pretty likely not. Unless you're a colored dude in the States then going for a jog, in which case I got nothing for you. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding um, next one's vincent mcleod thank you 10 pound super chat so knowing when to stfu is something i learned naturally after trp but it took a few years to realize interested if anybody in the chat is the same keep it up ryan i will keep it up and here's a funny point it's aside from no more mr nice guy but it's good to know um this isn't just some brand new esoteric knowledge that came out of a vacuum and nobody's ever heard of it before and it's all brand new stuff most guys, most guys know a lot of it. I always say the average success, like the guy who used to be alpha and now slowly became beta, that meme. Most of those guys kind of knew 80% of this now. They maybe didn't articulate it this way. They maybe didn't um, understand it. It was kind of instinctive. But then when they look back, they're like, yeah, I actually did do that. I just didn't even think about it. So 80% of this stuff, and even the most unattractive guys, 30, 40, 50% still. It's not that secret. It's just a matter of collecting it, putting it together, and wrapping a good enough description and narrative around it that you can make it a proper mental model that will run it on, I don't want to say autopilot, because it always requires some self-reflection and thought, but it gives you a grounding and a framework that you can build your life around in a way that's beneficial for you. Because right now, people have the Disney fantasy. You have TV telling you this, that, and the other thing. I could tell an example, but... I don't want to be the guy ranting about like Star Trek and stuff on here. And I'll save that for the nerds. <laughs> and I missed one. So Kali G, I see your $2 super chat. Cleaning my room will make me attractive. Correcting that though. Cleaning your room will not make you unattractive. And that's a subtle but important difference. Nobody sleeps with a guy because his room's clean. But people will sleep with a guy if he's a slob that can't even bother to be keeping his room clean. And I say that fully aware that, you know, actually, no, no, never mind. Kitchen's clean. <laughs> uh, da -da. All right. So I think we've hit everybody here. But yeah, so on that note, that's episode, what are you on now? Five? How many more do we got? We have another. So nine. It's going to be four more of these coming. I don't know the schedule yet. I'm going to take tomorrow off because tomorrow was Patreon time. If you guys haven't seen, private community on Patreon. 
Uh, check it out. It's Ryan Stone. I'm sure the link's in the description. It should add it by default. Come on in. Check it out. Take till the end of the month to have our little private conversations. They're kind of like this, only they're tailored to you. No filter. I don't mind dropping F-bombs. We don't mind talking about stuff that's definitely not female-friendly or YouTube community guidelines-friendly, but it's honest and it's open and it's discreet. So come on in, check it out. I don't charge till the end of the month. It's only the price of a cup of coffee, well, a fancy cup of coffee. And if you like it, stick around. At that point, we'll open you up to the forums, the locker room. You can go in there and have these conversations on your own. We can go over the material and I'm working with a bunch of guys and we're trying to get a library of Alexandretta of all this stuff I'm talking about because if I'm going to keep doing episodes like this of everything on the Red Pill content, it's going to take me like seven years to get through it all. So I'd rather just have it all there so you can go through it on your own time as well and just treat this as a supplement. But on that note, it's good to see you guys here. I'm going to catch you on the next one. And let's call this one an episode. Cheers. Bam 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 bam